welcome everybody to this OpenShift Commons briefing today as we like to do on um, Fridays. We try and do things that are sort of transformational, cultural shifting. Um, um, we have a, a kind of a leaning this past couple of weeks towards uh, security and DevOps and DevSecOps and we're really thrilled to have um, Steve Jagir from um, Stack Rocks with us to give us his um, layer cake approach to um, security and I'm going to let him introduce himself and um, talk for as long as he likes and then we'll have live Q&A at the end. So um, welcome and welcome Steve. I'm really pleased to have you here this morning. Yeah, thanks Diane. This is great. Uh, shall I just kick off then? Amazing. Please do. All right, <laughs> good. Yeah, all right, thanks for watching. This is Layer Cake. My name is Steve Jaguer. I am a cloud native security advocate uh, with StackRox. Uh, and what I want to talk about today is how we can move security to be more deterministic over probabilistic. Now, first thing I'll do is introduce myself because you may not know who I am. Um, my actual title is Director of Solution Architecture and Community Building uh, for EMEA. But as I am kind of the only technical guy here, I do a lot, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, on the screen, you can see my, you can follow me on Twitter. That is a, I, I like to live dangerously. That is a QR of my LinkedIn. So if you want to connect, let's be friends. I have a podcast called the Continuous Security Podcast. You can check it out on any good podcast source. I also run a meetup along with some friends from StackRox called Kubernetes Security. Check it out. And I also am a huge beer fan. You'll see that. It'll be part of my presentation. Be friends on Untapped. Why not? I also have a YouTube channel where I talk about beer. If you're really geeky, that's that's extreme though. All right. So the first thing I'd like to really get into is Kubernetes. Transformative. It wouldn't be a presentation about involving Kubernetes at all unless I had some kind of nautical themed photo. I like to have a picture of a containers, shipping containers, that joke. Uh, word clouds are great. People have word clouds. And then I'll talk about how it's changing the world. Amazing. But I, which I actually am going to do. I am going to talk about how it's changing security. But I'm going to have to put that into the context of the people who have to deal with security. And in our case, as Kubernetes and, and OpenShift enthusiasts, the people handling security is often the InfoSec team. There is kind of a separation in security of AppSec and InfoSec. They haven't quite embraced that DevOps collaborative bit yet. And because it's kind of, they still think of it as like a virtual data center, they have the same approach. And some of the struggles that they have to deal with are the idea of tooling being noisy, so they're looking for a needle in a haystack, versus not noisy, in which it's, in case it feels dangerous. It's like, what are we missing? Primitive versus expensive, and I think I might change primitive, but it's more like when you're trying to cobble something together on a budget versus buying some epic security platform and then wondering if you're getting value out of it, right? This is a common struggle. The historical security in this space has been a little bit reactive as opposed to proactive, and that's not intentional. Developers have control over the app. They didn't used to really factor security in. We're trying, we're trying to shift left. So the result was generally, here's an application, it's running on a VM or in a data center. How do I watch it really closely and make sure that nothing bad happens? So the struggle generally isn't that they don't want to be proactive, is that they don't necessarily know how to be proactive, and that's what I'm going to talk about. It ends up being probabilistic versus deterministic, or probability versus certainty. And it comes down to changing the equation. So risk equals likelihood times impact. If we can change either likelihood or impact, or ideally both, then we're off to a fantastic start. And we can do that with everything as code. This is the nirvana. Have we achieved it? Well, kinda. I'll get a high five for that. There are a lot of standards at the moment for creating everything as code. Different platforms have different ideals and different and different people have different levels of expertise. I mean, you've got your Terraform, your cloud formation, YAML, everyone loves YAML. And then you've got interesting changes like CDK and Pulumi and of course Helm and Ansible and all the other ones that people know and love. And I'm sure there will be more in years to come. Why do we need everything as code though? Because of humans. Humans are, we're idiots. We're our biggest own problem. We make mistakes. We produce non-repeatable results, no change control. We love tribal knowledge and many other re reasons. Humans don't tend to make good decisions. So we need to change the battlefield. And I feel I'm 
I think I stole that from The Art of War, but I'm not sure. What we want to do is reduce likelihood of risk. We can do that by employing checks earlier and often. You may have heard that before, but you need to know how. And we can do this by scanning our everything as code for misconfigurations or just insecure defaults or just operational risk. We can do that. And that's something we can heavily leverage. Can we reduce impact? Absolutely. What's great about declarative environments and particularly Kubernetes is that we can leverage chaos engineering. We don't have to cuddle all of our pods and our nodes and our clusters. We can embrace that cattle versus pets analogy and I'll apologize to the vegans because that's kind of a brutal analogy. We need a new one. Add comments if you've got a better one. But the overall idea is that we want to be able to utilize the context of that deterministic and declarative definition when we're looking at risk. And we can do that. The importance of context. Now what's fun is that I can see in the guest list for this that there's Byron on, Byron is watching this. This is a true story. And I'm stitching him up by saying that. We were in a morning meeting one time and he was telling me that he had a beer last night and he feels terrible. And I thought, oh, okay, well that doesn't seem so bad. What beer was it? Uh, it was this Imperial Stout. And this one on the screen is from Brew by Numbers. It's, ama it's amazing. Uh, I said, tell me more about it. And he went, all right, well, you know, it's a delicious stout. It's got American oak barrel aged. I mean, this is all sounds amazing, right? I uh, yeah, it was 10% maybe, and like, okay, right, that's, that's a factor, that's important. It kind of made me feel like that's like the vulnerability, that's the CVSS 10 in the container, right? But it doesn't matter, it still didn't make sense why it was a problem. And he, so he explained the situation. Let's take a look at his deployment YAML. So it's the Bimber BPA, it's the Imperial Stout, and the dinner he had that night was a salad. He's trying to ease off on the Christmas indulgence, you know what I'm saying? There were three replicas. He left that detail out. He was watching this super surreal TV show called American Gods, which is only 45 minutes, which means he, what, he had basically a bottle of wine in 45 minutes? Like, that's no good. And it was a break from dry January. Everything about this is a disaster. That is a, that's an actual risk. And that's kind of what I mean when I'm talking about vulnerabilities versus risk. Vulnerabilities are indicators only. All right. Let's get started talking about the layer cake. But first, another prerequisite of these sort of infrastructure as code talks is I have to say GitOps three times. GitOps is great, and I really like that Weaveworks has acknowledged Vitor Silva, who normally tweets in Portuguese, um, his, his GitOps in one slide, which is essentially Git as the single source of truth, Git as the single place where change happens, which is, yes, it's great, and we are, gung-ho on it. It's a little odd though, like being somebody who wrote code since the 90s, I've been writing code, putting it in source code control, creating pull requests, like this is not new. It's just funny that now that it's using, used for infrastructure as code and for just everything as code, it's like a wild new cool thing. But it, it's a good necessary thing. All right, now we're in the layers, the big moment. Look at that cake. Isn't that good? I made that cake. It's not a picture I downloaded off the internet. That's it. I made it. All right, let's, let's talk about the layers, and then we'll go through each one and talk about what we can do at each phase. Layer zero is the cloud, and I often get asked, why did you start at zero? Because it's an array. It's my, I'm a geek. Everything starts at zero. Layer zero is the cloud. That's our buttery biscuit base. The pipeline is number one. So the pipeline itself, that ubiquitous part of our entire supply chain. The application, the application's friends and dependencies, the image. The image goes into a deployment. The deployment goes into our runtime. Those are our phases. So let's talk about what we can do. Layer zero, we can secure the base. Infrastructure as code. There are tools for making that happen. There's, and I'm being wide open about this, like open source tools you can get for free, and some are built in, like Checkoff, Kix, TerraScan, these all work. There are free tools for maintaining, for maintaining state. Open CSPM is one. They all, Gartner's definition is CSPM. If, you don't, if you're watching, you don't know that, Cloud Security Posture Management. And there are other ones out there. Now, why do we need this? Again, humans are creating the code, so verification prior should be standard. We're used to doing this with code we write, and yet we feel like we have to say it for code that is infrastructure as code. But that's probably more important than the actual code. All right, so there are tools we can use, and 
there's just a quick run through on how easy it is. So what I've done is I've downloaded this probably super dodgy Terraform for AWS, <laughs> okay? And I've just picked one at random. And it, I like that this one actually outputs a variety of formats, by the way, human, JSON, all the machine consumables, it's all really good. And it's as easy as running Terrascan in this case, and Chekhov's the same. And whatever the Terraform is in the directory, you see the problems. So it's one of these things, I, I just want to lower the barrier of entry. The install for this was brew install. I'm on a Mac. I can go find the low hanging fruit that I know I need to fix. SSH port open. Yeah, okay, that seems bad. I, I am wondering actually now, why is that open in a WordPress AWS? Like it, this is a great example of, don't just download stuff and use it. Hey, scan it with stuff and take a look. I can go down, I can just delete that because I don't understand why that's there in the first place. And I'll just run a quick scan to make sure that my highs go from four to three. And we're good. Right. So that's the idea is it's, I could just take a few more seconds and I can go through the rest of this and I'm done. So that's just lowering the barrier, barrier to entry for the tools like this and knowing how you can do it is, is super easy. And you can embed these things into a pre-checks and CI CD pipelines. It's pretty simple. The pros of doing it, of course, infrastructure as code, controlled and observed. Great. So infrastructure as code is chaos engineering friendly because if we just destroy our cluster or our node or our pods, we should be able to put it back exactly in a known state and it reduces the dependence on tribal knowledge. This is why infrastructure as code is good and this is why we should check it. The cons of infrastructure as code from scratch is it's never from scratch. <laughs> it just like real code, it can be an amalgamation of, st of Stack Overflow cut and pastes and GitHub clones. And just like the one I just went and got, I just Googled WordPress Terraform and that was the first link, right? Which is kind of what people do. There And there are some bad defaults in there. Another thing that we're starting to see is that if say a template that like that became standard, people will do what they're already doing with images. They will template squat, they will change a, a one, an L to a one, and they will try to look like the one you want to use, but they will add changes to the trust boundaries that are bad. Another thing which is more operational, this kind of code can age over time because it's not getting as many updates and feature driven changes as actual application code. So you have to make sure you keep on top of it and you don't have a, an application of some IAC that is secure one day and insecure the next due to changes in your cloud provider. So worth knowing all that. Layer one, supply, securing the pipeline. What I mean by that is software supply chain integrity and providence. This is your internal supply chain. We focus a lot on things coming into our organizations and making sure we check those packages and make sure it's all good and hashes are right. Amazing. But what about internally? Now, I don't mean to pick on SolarWinds, it's just everybody knows about how that breach, well, I don't know if you know how that breach happened, but that is a supply chain compromise where malware was installing malware. Because it was able to inject during the build by watching a build its own pre-built package that had malicious intent. It, it was possible for them to not just hack SolarWinds, that would be small. It was, it, it was, they were able to manipulate their signed result and therefore deploy malicious malware to a much larger audience. Now, what could they have done to prevent that? Well, something, but probably not enough. It's not a, there are tools out there like in Toto, uh, Recorgafeus, these things are, are looking at your supply chain. And in Toto's easy to demo, it's a CNCF project, it's really cool, and it can prevent man in the middle attacks like that. But it's hard to deploy at scale, so I'm giving you the honest cons about it, right? In order for your supply chain to be managed for each component and each developer, everyone has to buy into a deployment like that. It can't just pick and choose, and that can be problematic to do. But there are options to make it happen. It would be cool to see people work more on things in this space. I don't actually know of any commercial solutions that do this yet, but it could be, given it's become front and center, that things will start to happen. Securing the code, familiar territory. Right, these are these these kinds of scanners are called SAST, Static Application Security Testing, tools in the code pipeline. I've singled out, you see I've got IDE SAST there. I've singled that out intentionally because I just don't think there's enough attention to that. There are 
many, many things you can put into your CI pipeline, which can scan all the code you wrote in a variety of languages. Great. But developers kind of hate those tools because they slow things down or they're poorly implemented. What they would really like is something that integrates directly into their, their environment, their IDE or their VS Code or whatever it is they're using, and just tells them as they go in an unintrusive way. That's the ideal, and there's just not enough good, good answers to that. Why do we need it? Same as infrastructure as code. Humans are writing it. I used, to, I used to work at a static analysis company, and we had stats on this. One in every 1,000 lines of code contains some kind of bug or insecurity. It doesn't take long to get to 1,000 lines, so it's worth doing. What are the pros? Some really obvious ones. Many open source and commercial offerings are available, and I've got one there I'll show you in a minute uh, that I really like. Cost benefits, finding anything early. Developers finding problems, the, there's numerous reports on like 100x cost differences between finding something in development versus finding it in testing versus pen testing versus support case versus a breach, the last one being probably the rarest, support cases probably being the most common, super expensive. And lastly, people don't talk about this enough. Static analysis checking is one of the few ways you can automatically traverse all your paths. Testing rarely does this. Pen testing doesn't do it. It's a really interesting thing. And even if you run a static analysis slow, out of band, occasionally it has high value because of that. What are the cons? Slow and potentially disruptive. Has a bad rap, I didn't write that down, but it kind of does. There can be a lot of false positives. The implementation is difficult, particularly in a modern microservice organization where the tech stack can be in multiple hands and can be different. And security choices are, are in the developer's hands and you can't impose something like this. So finding a one size fits all solution for static analysis is very hard. Few good IDE integrations, I'm going to hammer that again, and limited reach on next-gen languages. Now, let's next little demo. I'm going to go to guardrails.io and move fast, be safe. I like that. What I like about this is it's free. It says get started free. You get a lot for free. You log in, you're logging with your GitHub repo, and you can see all sorts of, like, I just got some of the repos that I like to collect for multiple languages. I turned off scanning some of them and I left one particular one on, which is Juice Shop. That's the OWASP known vulnerable, uh, with a lot of fun actually, you should go try it out, uh, for no, known vulnerable application for Node. And I scanned the master to see what it would find, which is great. And again, by the way, I, I did this, this is all yesterday, like where we went and did this, and I can see obvious SQL injection. I like that integrated directly with my GitHub, showing me really bad things. And it's got some integrations out of the box if you need them. I can look at my scan history and see whether it's recent. I can see what I'm scanning, what I'm not scanning. It's just like, I, I was blown away that this was here and I could just do it. I was even more blown away at the breadth of languages that it covers. It was cool, I tried a lot of them. The Kubernetes and the Terraform one was not that good. So. Other tools are available, we just looked at one. And we're gonna look up another one in a moment. So it's really pretty impressive. All right, layer three, we're gonna get there. Securing the open source supply chain. This is what I referred to earlier as the application's friends, the dependencies or the family. This is referred to mostly in the industry as SCA or software composition analysis or just dependency checkers, people call it. Um, free and open source solutions are available, which is awesome. A lot of these kind of things are becoming embedded into certain uh, areas. Uh, why do we need this? I, I could, so there are some commercial solutions on there and they make great reports. I, I like any company that makes awesome reports is great. Um, and they all kind of agree that about 80% of a modern software application is open source. Open source vulnerabilities are known to the bad guys. Even the script kitties that just like to go to Shodan and exploit DB and just try and write stuff and mess with you they're out there and we really we have to deal with them. The pros, we're finding the known vulnerabilities. That's more important than the unknown ones. Everyone knows about them. It's the low hanging fruit and it's something we really should do. The cons, and there always are, being uh, completely uh, open about this, it can be difficult to prioritize the results of these things. 
the dependencies, are they used? In what context are they used? Occasionally, when I'm writing code, I start using a whole bunch of packages and then I realize I don't need them and I don't remove them from my package JSON or I'm, I'm lazy, so I end up with bloat and it really confuses a scan like this. That's one reason. The other reason is there's like more, there's more than 15,000 CVEs released every year. 15,000, I think last year was 16. Uh, and it's, it's how do you manage that, right? So there can be false positives in areas where it just doesn't matter and its context is important. Securing the image, one of my favorite layers. Finding known vulnerabilities in base images and dependencies. And if you get a good one, one that will also look at package managers that are in the image and do a bit of that SCA we just talked about. So there's a bit of overlap there, which is good. You can also, there are also tools out there for checking Dockerfile best practices and there's open source. Like when I say Dockerfile best practices, there's a lot. There's a lot of articles out there. I just chose a couple, like using an ad instead of a copy is bad. Leaving the default user in, which is root, like January, I think it was 2019 was the run C vulnerability that if the image is left running as root, you could swap run C out and get remote code executed on the host as root, really bad. Why do we need this? Well, as I just indicated, defaults can be dangerous. Images are introducing user space, open source operating system dependencies that have critical vulnerabilities. It's a, it, for me, it's a must do. Well, the pros, once again, we are finding vulnerabilities and we can do it anywhere and it's really quick. It teaches you developers best practice when done right, so they get better and you get less noise. It does some of that SCA. I think the kind of like the bare minimum critical SCA, a lot of good tools, the, certainly the commercial ones can do that. Just be perfectly honest, Stackrocks does that, it's good. Plenty of open source free tools are available and that's great for getting started. Cons. Image scanning can become a bit of security theater because, because it seems to do so much, some organizations start thinking, all right, let's scan our images, and they scan a big bloated registry and it becomes overwhelming because they don't have context, so nothing happens. So worth knowing that when you start. Context, again, is important. That can, it can confuse vulnerability management if you're using an SCA tool and, because you get overlap. Let's take a quick look at how easy this can be. I, I am most familiar, I'm not, not being biased, but I'm just very familiar with Trivi. I like it because it works on the desktop. It scans images, you can scan a file system, you can scan a GitHub repo, you can put it in quiet mode so you can embed it into your CI. It kind of has all the bells and whistles that I need for doing the basics, but I am gonna show a caveat in a moment. So let's scan an Alpine 313, which I think is the latest. And it, it maintains its own database, so sometimes it takes some time. And I thought that was going to have nothing, because normally Alpine's the safe bet, but those are pretty new vulnerabilities. So there we go. Two modules with the same ones. Fixed version available, so I could take action on that. I would imagine there'll be a new version in like seconds. But if I try and scan something a little larger, this is where we, as a developer, we get in trouble. This is kind of why. You know, the ocean, the notion of DevSecOps and Shift Left can be troubling for a developer because if they do what you want and they use something like Trivi, there's a, I hate that tar vulnerability, then they look what they get. And they're not going to not use the latest Nginx. They're going to do it. So if we take a look at the, the top of this to see what we might have to contend with, and we'll get like the total of what L of them are, we can see that, okay, a bunch of vulnerabilities, one critical. So maybe I should look at that, right? And what I like about this is that. It's using Debian. I can see. I, I like that it shows me the the base. So if I clear the screen and we look at the latest, but I'm gonna filter on that just the critical vulnerability, and I'll get rid of that because I it's not gonna blast through the whole screen. Uh, and it's warning me you should never use the latest tag. Bad practice. Do as I say, not as I do. CV 2019 and list. So what would I do with that as a developer? I don't know if I can fix that. There's no fixed version. I just kind of got to let it go. Can, I can, I could, if I'm really keen, I could go to Showdown and I could see there's no exploit and I could feel maybe it's okay. That's a little more than I would expect a developer to do. But you see what I mean? This is one of those sort of eternal conundrums when we start pushing security in the hands of developers. All right, so I'm gonna just stop and I'm gonna, let's all go to the lobby and think about where we are right now. We 
hopefully have scanned our infrastructure as code, we've cleared everything off, we've provisioned our, our resources, hopefully we've got something looking at our application, maybe we have something in our supply chain, making sure that we've got, we know that the ingredients to our cake are the same ingredients we put in the cupboard earlier, probably we're scanning the application. Most likely we're doing image scanning, great. So we're we're starting to amass a certain amount of vulnerabilities, and that's where vulnerability management can come become a bit of a burden. So let's talk about how we can get some risk context here. How can we add that? Securing the deployment. What can we do here? Well, the same as we did for that Terraform scan, we can learn best practices for Kubernetes objects, both operational risk and security risk. Why? We can bring a central context to image deployment and vulnerability management because defaults, once again, can be dangerously insecure. And I'll show you what I mean by that. First, what's great, many open source tools are available. I, I love that. Uh, there's a few there, Kubelander, Kubescore, check out, blah, 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 there's a whole bunch, right? Uh, a few weeks back, I think, well, there, there was a great demonstration on Kubelander. I'm gonna give you the two second version of it. Um, so Kubelander is super easy to use. You stall again with brew. So if you're on a Mac, dead easy. And if you wanna know how to use it, there's not a lot of options. So you can digest this pretty quick. If you wanna see what the checks that exist are, it's easy. Just write checks, list, and you can see the things that you're looking for. Things you would expect, unset CPU requirements, open SSH port again, like we had before, run as non-root. You see some of them are true, some of them are false. I like that actually, because the default, not all of them are on by defaults, but the must haves are. So it's kind of a good way of doing it, I think. If you want to scan, it's very similar. You just type kubelinter lint, you pick your file and you can see I've got one called rushed. This is typical of a YAML. Why is it rushed? Well, did I put the CPU request? No, no one does that when they're rushing. I'm, I'm not, let's see, server is set to run, like not set to run as root, that's really bad. I like that I get some information and a link, so I can go over here and I can go, right, okay, set security context for the pod. Probably the single most missed section of YAML is the security context. Makes me sad. So what I've done already, I'm not gonna go fix it, I fixed it already, and I've got the one that I should have. I scan it, no errors are found, and if you're wondering what changes I made, I'll show you the difference. It's nothing, hardly. I've got some resource requests in there. They're a little bloated at the moment, but I'll adjust them later, and I've got a security context that makes me safe by default. Amazing. Super easy to do. I do have a caveat for that when I talk about scanning YAML files. There are some growing popularity of abstraction layers. So CDKs is one, I think Plumi is another one where you can embed the generation of Kubernetes right into some code. It sounds awesome. I see these things and I get super excited because I'm thinking I can type TypeScript and I can create a service in my TypeScript and I can interact with it like live. That's neat. I like that. Until I start thinking about security. What if I kubelinter the resulting YAML and there are insecure defaults? How do I translate the results back into the other code I wrote? It's kind of, there's a bit of extra security headache going on there if we do that. So worth knowing that. The same thing happens when you're writing JavaScript for the browser. You might write it in TypeScript, you generate the code that goes into the browser, you find mistakes there. What does it look like in TypeScript? There's all this mapping you gotta do, it's a pain. So that was the one caveat. But the reality is many open source tools are available. The cons, and it would be cool if we did this more in open source, but it, I, I, maybe I should write an open source project that does it, Steve. Few, if any, of the open source tools combine the scanning for image vulnerabilities with the linting of the YAML. Wouldn't that be cool? Because the images are there, they're called out. If we could do, double that in and use that context, that would be pretty nice. There are, I mean, I'm from Stackrocks. The Stackrocks commercial tool does that, which is cool, but it would be cool to see an open source version that did it. Uh, now to talk about what we do at Stackrocks, just a little bit of a, we have those vulnerabilities. Why is it cool to get the context? Just like the can of beer with the 10% that, that, that poor Byron had, if I know the vulnerability is going into test only and not going into prod, 
that's different. That changes the changes the risk profile. If I know the criticality of the app based on insisted metadata, if I know whether it's running privilege, that's really bad. If I know if it has access to certain secrets, I know it's blast radius because there's a load balancer in front of it. I know it's a simple pod with an easily characterizable process. Um, process, I don't know, very simple app. Nginx is a good example. Then I can characterize it. I know what an anomaly looks like. All these things matter because if we think about a CVSS 9.8 in a backend service with no external connectivity, not privileged, with a recorded small baseline of activity, cool. I actually might let that go. If there's a 7.6 that's in my front end API behind a load balancer with an exposed port by accident, a complex base image that maybe has all those tools hackers love, like curl and wget and nmap and all those, right? That's so much worse. But the prioritization of vulnerabilities just based on CVSS score wouldn't agree with me. So this is why we need to start looking at the context. We need to focus on deployments in YAML and look at things in the context of Kubernetes objects. All right, layer six, the icing on the cake, the runtime. Maintaining the state of security. This is also great. There are some very cool things out there, eBPF driven, like Bauco was awesome, Tracy from Aqua, anomalies as Kubernetes objects can be found, prevention by admission controllers, by a policy, security as policy with things like OPA and Kyburn, I just started playing with is pretty neat. All of this is a great move to runtime. Why do we need to do it? Well, there's only so much we can do in layer zero to five, right? We shouldn't do nothing. We want to make as little happen here as possible. And we want to get as much information so that when we are making runtime decisions on alerts, we're making them data driven. Zero day exploits on new attack vectors are going to happen. We need runtime. What are the pros of runtime? Okay, this is a cynical pro, but InfoSec people understand things like EDR and IDS. They, they understand the world of runtime. So when you've got runtime and you're speaking of it in terms of Kubernetes, this speaks the language of InfoSec and it goes down very well. Zero days and anomaly detections are still required and it's an essential safety net for all the things you didn't do in zero to five. The cons? This is still reactionary, it's still probabilistic, it's labor intensive, it's expensive, it's one of those horse bolted door closed kind of things sometimes if something does happen, but it's all still required. So the key takeaways before I wrap up, shifting left is good. People say it a lot in security, actual developers probably never hear it very often, but what it means is we're trying to push security over there. The problem essentially is the more people you involve in your security problem, the better it gets, but the harder it is to deploy. Shifting middle, people are starting to say this. Actually, a recent uh, report called BSIM 11, I think it was, called it Shift Everywhere, which I kind of like until it wears off. <laughs> Simpler checks, but more often. And this is what I'm trying to convey. It's actually all the things I just showed you are pretty easy because they're just little things. It seems like a lot of things, but they're all little easy things. And they mean that when you get to runtime, a lot of the easy stuff's gone. Context is a huge advantage. I like to drive that home. We don't use it enough, and it can be absolutely critical for ensuring that our image vulnerabilities are prioritized correctly. Everything in this code is great, reduces imperative intervention, but remember the same security concerns are there that were there for when we wrote application code as are there for when we write infrastructure as code code. We should scan it, we should put it in Git and control it, treat it with the same respect. GitOps from plus Kubernetes enables us to do that and declarative equals deterministic equals less probabilistic. Deterministic security by through Kubernetes. So that is the end. Thank you very much. That is me. Well, that was wonderful. You deserve a, a really good beer for that. Uh, Thank Ed you. Al. And you deserve to track it on, on Untapped and talk about I it if you're needed. That that's, that's wonderful. Um, I, you know what was wonderful is it was um, there were so many different um, projects and products and small things people could do and takeaways and and that was and like trivia I hadn't even seen trivia yet so I'm gonna go play with that um, sometime soon and just last week or the week before we had the Cube Linter folks on, mm -hmm. um, uh, Michael Foster and B Vish Vishu, 
I think from um, Vishwa. From Sac Vishwa, thank you. Yeah. I always I kill his name every time. Um, and and that's I think that's the biggest uh, one of the big takeaways from this is that there are lots of small things you can do to make um, security you know part and parcel of the DNA of any workflow or any deployment pipeline. And that, that's really been. Um, I, one of the, the, the mantras that we've had um, in some of the conversations we've been having about DevSecOps and mm -hmm. um, the shift left conversations too. And, and I, you know, and I really think, and, and I think, and the more we talk about context is king or queen, shall we say, um, yep. that I think is the key here is that, um, and, and I forget which slide it was you were on where you were talking about uh, combining Chekhov and Kubelinter and a few other things to create that um, solution mm -hmm. or something, um, and you know those those are the things that because um, CVs are so noisy, there are so many of them out there. Um, it's the context, I think, and I, that I, I like how you speak to that um, uh, piece of it, and I think that's the thing that people um, miss. We we create great dashboards for yeah. you know when when a CV is there, when we you know we've created an image that has something that needs to be patched and this is the patch you should do. But, uh, you know, the t many of the tools that you have there are pieces of it, but um, creating uh, an environment and workflow that um, takes advantage of it and doesn't notify me at two in the morning that um, some, <laughs> some new thing, yeah. And as, as Mike is saying, observability is key. And, and that's really, that that's another key piece of it. So. I think that that that's a wonderful thing, and and I'm so glad, um, you know, that Stack Rocks and Red Hat are you know they're going to be working together closely as, as you know and and doing more of this work. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, I think people are just you know one first blown away. We all want the cake. Um, and, and <laughs> yeah. Did you ask? Did you actually make that cake? No. Oh, no, that was a, that is stolen off the internet. No. So. That's the okay. beauty of the. We'll cut this out when we put it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I definitely made. I did not make the cake. I'm a terrible baker. I, it would have been a disaster. Yeah, I love I, Great British Bake Off, but I'm a bad baker. Yeah, no, I, I think that's 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 pretty. Um, I, you covered a lot there. I think we'll get some feedback from folks um, when we post it. One of the things that I'm probably going to try and go back do is annotate um, your talk um, with links to some of you know all of these wonderful tools that you've pointed out. Um, I think that's that's really an amazing. Um, toward a force on what's available out there. And and I do think you need to start your own open source project. Got it. Hint, hint, somewhere <laughs> soon. So um, we'll definitely take you on on that and um, we'll be seeing some really um, fun stuff coming out in the not too distant future. And we'll definitely have you back again um, soon um, uh, to talk about other things um, related to this topic and um, wonderful. And please, if you are listening to this, take a look at the um, Continuous Security podcast and check out Cube Native Security. Uh, Steve, you're, you're one of the best um, presenters of this information that I've, I've heard in a long time. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Diane. It's been great. All right. Take care, all. <laughs>